the question on everyone's mind, judging from the comments on uh, recent videos, is has Anwar Ibrahim betrayed the Malaysian people or has he betrayed Malaysia? Imras Iqbal seems to think it's a bit premature to make that um, statement. He, in a recent video, said if Najib gets house arrest, that would be the line cross, you know, the line drawn in the sand. That would definitely be a betrayal. To me, even giving him a discount uh, on his um, fine as well as a 50% reduction on his jail term is already a betrayal. Let's put it in context. La. He's the biggest kleptocrat in modern history. Okay? Even the US Justice Department said this is the biggest sakau in the whole world. And yet we give discount. How bloody stupid can Malaysia get, you know? It's incredibly incomprehensible to me. It's like, it's all right to sakau la, like that. Oh, yo, I have, you know, I'm trying very hard to not use expletives here. But it just makes me so angry, you know? And I'm sure this anger is reflected by a lot of people uh, who've commented. You know, they feel the same way. Now, let's put things in, in perspective, okay? 65% of Malaysian voters are Malays. Non-Malays only constitute 35%. So as far as the, con uh, the uh, what do you call it, politicians are concerned, the non-Malays are largely irrelevant. If they can get all the Malays, I know, to vote for them, then um, uh, you know they can be in power. They can even get almost two-thirds majority. And if some non-Malays vote, uh, vote for them, they can get a two-thirds majority and can and they can do whatever they please. And let me second guess what's on Anwar's mind. Now, when you look at all the possible candidates who can be PM, please discount Abang Johari, okay? He's not even an MP. Even if he's an MP, he needs to get the cons confidence of the majority of the MPs. And the majority of the MPs are from Semenanjung. Less than 35% are from Sabah and Sarawak. So he'll never become PM, whether how good he is. Okay, so that's the reality. Please face that. I, they don't have 35% because that's what they've been asking for and they were denied that. So I know it's less than 35. How much exactly you have to go and find out. Lah. I, 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 you know, I can't see very well, so I can't go to the day one right yet. Um, what do you call it? Um, website and go and count and all that. Lah. Okay, Anwar knows that of all the possible candidates, he's the least bad. Okay, we can discount um, Mahade, we can discount Muyidin, uh, Hadi Awang, I don't think he'd be acceptable by, by a lot of people, even some Malays or so, you know, people like Siti Kasim and Zaid probably won't support uh, Hadi Awang as PM. And people will think a similar way. Uh, KJ is largely self-serving opportunist. La, so, you know, uh, I, I wouldn't... I don't see him as PM material, okay? Although he may think he is, la, you know, but he seems to forget that his rise was largely due to his, you know, father-in-law rather than his own merit. This is uh, cronyism at work. I first met him in about 95 or so when he was an undergraduate at Oxford. At that time, I was a Couture Bureau Penerangan of Club Amno London. I wasn't a member of Amno, but I was like a member of Club Amno London. Primarily, it's an excuse of it to see ministers and um, uh, prime ministers when they go to London. You just have access to them. Uh, for example, I met Pala uh, when he came to London and, you know, can meet the Malaysian High Commissioner and things like that. So anyway, I used to edit their magazine called Chris and the newsletter. And um, we 
we ran a seminar at one time at Malaysia Hall, and KJ came. He didn't identify himself. He was an unknown at that time. I wasn't just an undergraduate at Oxford at the time. He sat at the back of the seminar, didn't talk to anyone, just observed. And um, I thought, you know, and later when I found out who he was, I thought that was very sneaky behavior. So because of that, I don't have much um, respect for him. Also, um, I mean, this is hearsay, and the person who told me has already passed away. So, well, I won't mention it because I don't have evidence to, to support it. Uh, but it um, tells uh, about his motivation why he joined politics in the first place, okay? Um, it's a long story. If you've heard the story, you, you probably know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, I don't think it'll be appropriate to put it in the public domain. Okay, so Anwar thinks he's the best candidate. As far as the rest of Malaysia is concerned, he's the least worst candidate. Uh, you know, the problem with politicians is they live in an echo chamber of yes-men and psychopaths, you know. So they believe all this, um, uh, like they're so great now because, you know, they, they live in this echo chamber. And because he thinks he's so great, and has a good chance because the rest are worse than him. He can start uh, playing the nonsense. Lah. And uh, people are upset because you're using taxpayers' money to, to solve other countries' problems when we have a lot of pressing problems uh, at home. Now, on the surface, the Malaysian economy looks good. You know, GDP growth dropped actually, uh, 0.6% in Q3. Well, the estimates for Q3 said it, uh, likely to drop 0.6%, uh, to 5.3% growth compared to Q2, which was 5.9% growth. And then in, uh, what I call inflation figures are controlled so-called but inflation figures are based on the basket of um, you know the consumer price index and all that but most of the things in the basket are uh, price controls item and don't reflect things that people actually buy let me give you an example before covid one liter of drain hole unsweetened soy milk used to cost 195 at Sergimat and now the cheapest I can get, either at Eon or Segiman or 99 Speedman, is 279 That's a 43% increase. It increased by 84 cents, okay? And that's just one item. Of course, soybean is not in the basket, lah, so it's not reflected in our inflation rate. So that's a reality. Lah. Then there are lots of other things which are necessities uh, to a lot of people, but not in the basket that they use to calculate inflation and consumer price index. So you should take that with a you know pinch of salt. So in any case, all these um, growing export figures um, it won't be reflected as real benefits to the people immediately. There'll be a time lag. It takes time. So right now, people see a dissonance. You say the economy is so great, but I have to pay more for this, pay more for that. So people are upset. They think they're being lied to. Um, they think um, they're being, you know, given a lot of bullshit and whitewash. There's a dissonance there, lah, you know. So that's why people are upset. It's it's really sad, you know. In fact, it's it's um, it's pathetic when you don't choose the best candidate, but you have to choose. You got no choice but to choose the least bad candidate. It doesn't bode well uh, for Malaysia. And uh, I think by the time GE16 comes around, uh, Anwar will be nearer 80 than anything else. It's about time we start thinking of succession planning. So who would be good um, PM? Um, in, in past, history shows that normally it's a DPM who becomes PM. Have you got two DPM, one from... Uh, I don't know like this guy, whether it's Sabah or Strava, I'm not familiar with him. As far as concerned, he's a nobody. He's just plunked plunk there. I never heard of him until we came PM or Fadila, whatever. The guy with the girl's name. Lah. Anyway, then there's Zahid. Zahid is really unacceptable lah, to a lot of um, people, especially the non malays So uh, he may think he's PM material, but I think you know, a lot of people 
don't agree with him. So, why? What does the future lie in store for Malaysia? Now, a lot of people say there's nothing in the constitution that forbids a non-Malay to be PM. Well, that is true. Anwar in December 23 made a statement that a PM will always be a Malay. But let's not jump the gun and go so far down the road. Why don't we have a non-Malay as a DPM? We've never had a non-Malay as a DPM before. I think that would be a more realistic first step than having a non-Malay PM. If a non-Malay were to be PM, I would put my money on Anthony Loke, okay? There's a lot of um, propaganda about against DAP, primarily last time, lah, spread by AMNO, um, communist, lah, this, lah, that. Lah. Uh, but when you look at it, it's the most principled um, political party. They have ideology. You know, there's one party they call a People's Justice Party or something. It's more like the leader, justice for the leader at one time because the leader went to jail and all that. And of course, you know, it was a political prosecution. You know, they made up all this thing about the mine blackang and all that and put him in jail, put him in solitary confinement, uh, smash his eye, gave him a black eye, had to appear in court with a black eye. And then I'm not sure about his back. Did he fall off a horse or was he beaten up in jail and, you know. And then recently I read uh, he did surgery in Germany for his spine. But previously I know he went to Turkey for surgery for his spine. So there seems to be some conflict there. Or maybe he had two different surgeries. But anyway, his, his spine doesn't seem to give him any issues now. He seems to be in good health. He's not obese. He doesn't have uh, cardiovascular disease. At least nothing in the public domain about his uh, having any health issues. <laughs> but it, wouldn't it be ironic if he were to get AIDS, you know? Because if he did, uh, then the whole apple cart would be um, upturned. Lah. Anyway, that's speculation. Forget about that. So the reality is people want to get the Malay voters. Now, the Malay voters are split. You have the hardcore um, lemmings who follow the leader and will, you know, brown nose the leader at all costs. Uh, they will jump off a cliff for the leader. Um, two sides. You've got the Amno people, all the followers of Bosco, who will junjong him to, uh, to hell and beyond. And it may seem incomprehensible to a lot of people why they do this. The answer is simple, the da. You give some people, people are desperate, uh, $50, they will go and, you know, it's like rent a crowd lah. You can have a demo, you pay everyone $50 and you know, all that. So money talks. That's the reality. They will support you as long as you feed them some da lah. That's the, that's the standard. That's how low Malaysian politics is, lah. You know, no ideologies, you know, just. And how they can succeed at this is because they purposely keep the Malays uneducated, uh, stupid, and, um, what do you call it? So that they can manipulate them. It's a power structure thing. Okay. They practice what we call ethnology, keeping people ignorant so that you can subjugate them and exploit them. Let me give you another example. Do you know that in Sabah and Sarawak, there's no public universities that has a law school? And um, I did ask a former minister. He has since passed away, but I think at that time he was minister for higher education. And his answer was this. They do not want um, Sabahans and Sarkans to know their rights. So they make it harder for them to study law. Just like in Brunei, there's no law school in Brunei, in, 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 you know, Brunei University. So if you want to study law and you're in uh, Sabah and Sarawak, you have to go, come to Semenanjung. Um, there's, of course, expense associated with that. Or if you can afford it, you can go to Australia to study law or New Zealand. Not a Sabahan study in New Zealand for some reason or another. So the Malays are divided. And because of that, the Malay politicians have to try to win over the other faction. Lah. 
So that's why uh, Anwar is trying to be more holy uh, than uh, past. And that's why you see all these bills and all these initiatives, mandatory halal certificate, whatever, just to win over the fence system lays, you know. The hardcore Islamists uh, will not vote for Amno or, or what do you call it, PKR. They will stick to Matibati, stick to PAS because... You know, they've got 72 furries waiting for them in Jana and all that nonsense. Lah. It's sad lah. when I see what the future holds for Malaysia. It's bleak. It's not that optimistic. You may be hoodwinked by the propaganda put out by the Madadi government, but uh, reality is a lot bleaker than uh, what they depict it to be. So how do we correct this situation? The lowest hanging fruit is to screw Anwar's head on right. So we need to like make it known what is acceptable to the rakyat and what is not. I mean, look at what the budget 2025 gave to the Indians, 180 million. And what did it give Jakim? 2 billion, you know, like 9% of that. And Jakim's not the only... Uh, race-based or religious-based organization, there's MARA, okay, Majlis Amanah Rakyat, which is a misnomer lah. It's not for the Rakyat, it's Majlis uh, Amanah Bumi Putra, you know, it's, it's a, it's a nationalist racist organization. Um, I mean, that's a reality lah. I mean, even AMNO is a United Malays nationalist organization. Uh, it's a nationalist organization because it wanted a uh, nation, wanted independence from the British. And having attained that, it was no, wrong, no longer relevant. Its ideology was no longer relevant. You want a nation, you got your nation. Then it started neo-colonialism. It started being racist and starting to be the political master for of the other races. Okay, uh, first they had the alliance. I don't know how many people remember the alliance. You know, the symbol was a kapalaya, and the three main parties was MIC and MCA together with AMNO. And over a decade or two. Uh, people like Mahade played out MIC and MCA. I think now they don't even have a member of parliament uh, in the party. So they become largely irrelevant, just like Gerard Khan is also largely irrelevant. The only party I see that has relevance or has ideology, solid ideology, is uh, the Democratic Action Party. They really do take democratic action. They also are part of um, the social democrat movement around the world. So their ideology is based on solid ground. Of course, you may have one or two people who who don't toe the line, but those people are disciplined, okay? Um, unlike some other parties, you can have a Batu Api shooting his mouth off and all they say, oh, that's his personal opinion. If it's not said by the party president, it's not the party opinion and everyone has a right to their, their personal opinion. I mean, it shows that you're weak, like you can't control your junior members, you know? So, so how can you respect people like that? I know this is very circular. I, I'm mostly thinking out aloud rather than, um, you know, what Imra do very uh, targeted kind of uh, voice note. I'm more of a writer than an orator, as you know. And um, when I talk, I tend to ramble like this because I, I talk and think at the same time. I normally write because when I write, I write many drafts. I think through and then I polish it, I edit and all that before it's done. And then I don't like reading what I've written because, you know, my eyesight is so bad that I, I can't read very well and record the same time. So I use the AI voice. And uh, being a visually impaired person, I have a lot of friends who are also visually impaired. And, uh, you know, blind people also need to know about politics, okay? So that's why I put the AI voice so that since they can't read the, um, the text, they can at least listen even though it's in a cha cha AI voice, okay? The cha cha AI voice, I tell you, is better than mine. Okay, let's put it that way. So that's it for today. 
have a great weekend coming soon and pray for better Malaysia. If you want to see more content like this, make sure to like, share, subscribe, and hit the bell notification so you don't miss any new videos.